STS-128 ISS Assembly Flight 17A was a NASA Space Shuttle mission to the International Space Station ISS that launched on the 28th of August 2009. Space Shuttle Discovery carried the multi-purpose logistics module Leonardo as its primary payload. Leonardo contained a collection of experiments for studying the physics and chemistry of microgravity. Three spacewalks were carried out during the mission, which removed and replaced a materials processing experiment outside ESA's Columbus module, and returned an empty ammonia tank assembly. The mission's first launch attempt was delayed due to weather concerns, including multiple weather violations in NASA's launch rules, beginning over two hours before the scheduled launch. The second launch attempt, scheduled for 26 August 2009 at 1 hour 10 minutes and 22 seconds Eastern Daylight Saving Time, was called off the previous evening due to an anomaly in one of the orbiter's fuel valves. The launch finally took place on 28 August 2009 at 23.59 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Discovery landed on the 11th of September 2009 at Edwards Air Force Base, which was the last landing of a shuttle to occur at the California site. Topic: Crew. Topic: Crew notes. Nicole Stott was originally scheduled to return aboard Soyuz TMA-15, but a change in the flight plan was made due to the possible flight delays in future shuttle missions, which could have extended Canadian astronaut Robert Thirsk's mission beyond the six-month duration preferred for station crew members. STS-128 was the final space shuttle flight used for ISS crew rotation, with Nicole Stott replacing Tim Copra. Stott returned on STS-129, but that flight did not bring her replacement. The mission of Krista Fuglesang was named Elise by the European Space Agency. The name was proposed by Jürgen Modlich from Bayerbrunn, Germany. The name refers to the 15th century explorers who used the trade winds to follow Christopher Columbus across the oceans to the New World. STS-128 also marked the first time two Hispanic Americans were on the same crew. John Danny Olivers of El Paso, Texas, made his second trip into space, and Jose M. Hernandez of Stockton, California, made his first. Both are of Mexican heritage. Topic: Mission payload. Topic: Multi-purpose logistics module (MPLM) Leonardo. The primary payload of STS-128 was the multi-purpose logistics module Leonardo to assist with establishing a six-man crew capacity by bringing extra supplies and equipment to the station. The multi-purpose logistics module contained three racks for life support, a crew quarter to be installed in Kibo, a new treadmill Colbert that will temporarily be placed in Node 2 and later in Node 3, and an air revitalization system ARS that will temporarily be placed in Kibo and later in Node 3. Leonardo specifications Length, 21 feet 6.4 meters Diameter, 15 feet 4. 6 meters Payload mass launch, 27,510 pounds 12,480 kilograms Payload mass return, 16,268 pounds 7,379 kilograms Empty weight, 9,810 pounds 4,450 kilograms Topic: Lightweight Multi-Purpose Carrier (LMC). 
The shuttle carried a lightweight multi-purpose experiment support structure carrier LMC with ammonia tank assembly ARTA. The new ammonia tank will replace an empty tank during an EVA. Topic: <laughs> Tridar. The shuttle flew the first test flight of the Tridar, a 3D dual sensing laser camera intended for potential use as an autonomous rendezvous and docking sensor. The Tridar successfully tracked the ISS position and orientation from the shuttle during docking operations. Topic: Other science packages. It will also contain three racks dedicated to science, FER fluids integrated rack and the first materials science research rack MSRR1 to be placed in Destiny and Melfi 2 -80 laboratory freezer for ISS to be placed in Kibo. The FER will enable detailed study of how liquids behave in microgravity, a crucial detail for many chemical reactions. One experiment, for instance, will examine how mixtures known as colloids behave without being stirred by sedimentation and convection. Another using the light microscopy module LMM will examine how an ideal heat pipe works without the distortions of gravity. <laughs> <laughs> Mission experiments The STS-128 mission as did STS-125 and STS-127 took part in crew seat vibration tests that will help engineers on the ground understand how astronauts experience launch. They will then use the information to help design the crew seats that will be used in future NASA spacecraft. STS-128 repeated the boundary layer transition BLT, detailed test objective DTO, experiment that was done by the same shuttle during STS-119. In this experiment, one of the thermal protection systems was raised to create a boundary layer transition in which the airflow becomes turbulent beyond a certain speed. During STS-119 the tile was raised 0.25 inches millimeters above the others, tripping the flow at Mach 15 during re-entry. In the modification being done, the tile has been raised 0.35 inches millimeters to trip at Mach 18 producing more heat. Discovery undertook the testing of a catalytic coating which was meant to be used by the Orion spacecraft. Two TPS tiles located in the protuberance downstream from the BLT tile had been fully coated with the catalytic material in order to understand the entry heating performance. The tiles were instrumented to collect a wide variety of data. Topic. Mission milestones The mission marked 159th NASA manned space flight 128th shuttle mission since STS-1 37th flight of Discovery 30th shuttle mission to the ISS 103rd post-Challenger mission 15th post-Columbia mission 32nd Shuttle Night Launch NASA's first Space Shuttle launch to take place during two calendar days 25th Anniversary of Discovery's first flight, STS-41D Shuttle processing Discovery rolled out from the orbiter processing facility to the vehicle assembly building after the external tank was cleared for use and was mated with it. The foam insulation on the tank underwent stringent pull tests after the foam liberated and hit the orbiter during STS-127. 
The STS 128's tank initially exhibited no concerns while the STS 127 case was determined to be a one off case due to surface contamination prior to foam application. The main change from previous missions is the change of the ground umbilical carrier plate GUCP, vent housing. The quick-release vents exhibited leaks during STS-119 and STS-127, which were determined to be due to a misalignment in the vent. This led to the one-part rigid seal in the external tank being replaced with a two-part flexible seal. Discovery later rolled out from the VAB to launch Complex 39A on the 4th of August 2009 in a slow drive on the top of the crawler transporter. The 3.4 mile, 5.5 kilometers rollout began at 2:07 Eastern Daylight Saving Time and ended with the launch platform secured in place at about 13:50 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. The move took longer than expected due to adverse weather conditions, which included lightning warnings. The crawler also had to pause occasionally so mud could be removed from its treads and bearings. Technicians then quickly prepared the shuttle to host the crew's countdown dress rehearsal known as the Terminal Countdown Demonstration Test TCDT. Discovery's seven astronauts flew to Kennedy on 5 August 2009 for the training activity which concludes later in the week with a complete practice countdown, minus liftoff, involving the crew and the launch team. Meanwhile, in an unprecedented operation, modifications were made to the left solid rocket booster on the pad. The modifications involved replacement of a check valve filter assembly in the booster which was found to have broken. In a potentially delaying factor, in-depth testing of the external tank with X-ray revealed voids in the foam which might have formed during the injection molding of the foam. This has also been decided as a suspect factor in the foam shedding during STS-127. The air in the voids could have expanded due to the high temperatures generated during ascent thus breaking the foam. The reviews considered a rollback as an option since the defect could not be set right in the pad. Later, the tank was cleared for launch as is without any additional inspections. Topic. Launch attempts The first launch attempt was delayed by 24 hours due to weather concerns, including multiple weather violations in NASA's launch rules beginning over two hours before the scheduled launch. During the second attempt on Wednesday morning, a problem with a LH2 fill and drain fuel valve inside Discovery's aft compartment led to another scrubbing. The problem arose when sensors did not detect the closure of the valve when commanded to do so. The issue was thought to be with the sensors rather than the valve itself. After inerting the orbiter's tank, which involved draining it, tests were conducted on the valves. Despite the valves working normally, another delay was called for to have more confidence in the system, and to give the console operators who performed the test some rest. The launch team evaluated the issue, passing on a possible launch window on 27 August 2009 at 1.10 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. The launch was delayed until 23.59 Eastern Daylight Saving Time, 28 August 2009, to allow the engineers to be fully satisfied with the vehicle. Later the mission was cleared for launch which involved a flight rule waiver for cycling the valve and a discussion to analyze the test failure of an Ares-1 booster that was similar to the SRBs used for the mission. NASA feared another delay when storms formed near the Kennedy Space Center on 28 August 2009, but the weather cleared in time for a successful launch of Discovery at 23.59 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Topic. Mission timeline Topic. The 28th of August Flight Day 1 launch 
After launch at 23.59 Eastern Daylight Saving Time, Discovery opened her payload bay doors. Once the doors were opened the crew deployed the Ku band antenna and activated the Shuttle Remote Manipulator System SRMS. Once the Ku band antenna was deployed and activated the crew then downlinked photos from the external tank umbilical well camera system, so controllers on the ground could see how the tank performed and how much if any foam was shed during ascent. The 29th of August flight day 2 TPS survey During Discovery's first full day on orbit, the crew used the SRMS to grapple the orbiter boom sensor system OBSS and survey the wing leading edges, nose and other parts of the thermal protection system TPS as well as the orbital maneuvering system OMS pods. During this time some of the crew were preparing the space suits that will be used during the three extravehicular activities EVA and setting up the tools that will be used during the docking. This includes installing the centerline camera and extending the orbiter docking system ring extension. Topic: The 30th of August flight day 3 docking. Discovery docked with the pressurized mating adapter PMA2 on the front of the Harmony connecting module. Before the shuttle docked, Commander Rick Sturkow performed what is known as a rendezvous pitch maneuver while Expedition 20 Commander Gennady Padalka and Flight Engineer Michael Barrett took photos of the shuttle's belly. The photos were downlinked to Mission Control for review. After docking, Nicole Stott and Tim Copra switched Soyuz seatliners, making Stott an Expedition 20 flight engineer and Tim Copra an STS-128 mission specialist. The joint crews also performed some transfers from the shuttle mid-deck and checked on the pressure in the MPLM Leonardo. Topic. The 31st of August, flight day 4 MPLM berthing. During flight day 4, the MPLM Leonardo was berthed to the Nadir, the Earth-facing port on Harmony, using the space station remote manipulator system SSRMS. Once it was berthed, the crews activated it and opened the hatch for ingress. Some more items were transferred from the shuttle mid-deck including the MDS experiment and the space suits Danny Olivers and Nicole Stott would use during EVA-1. The pair also prepared all the tools that would be used during the EVA with some help from Tim Copra. Later during the night when the crews were asleep, the team of ground controllers vented the Port 1 P1 ammonia tank assembly ATA nitrogen vent lines in preparation for the ATA to be removed during EVA 1. Topic: The 1st of September, flight day 5 EVA 1. EVA-1 was performed, and saw the removal of the empty ammonia tank assembly, and the removal and stowage of the UTEF and MISSE-6 experiments. While the spacewalk was going on crew members inside were transferring the crew quarters, COLBERT treadmill and the Node 3 Air Revitalization System Rack ARS. The treadmill and ARS were temporarily stowed, while the crew quarters was installed in the Kibo module where setup and activation was begun. Topic: The 2nd of September, flight day 6. During flight day 6, the joint crews continued the activation of the new crew quarters. The last of the major transfer items, the Fluids Integrated Rack FER, Materials Science Research Rack and the -80 Laboratory Freezer ISS2 Melfi2 were transferred from the Multipurpose Logistics Module MPLM Leonardo. Astronauts Danny Olivers and Jose M Hernandez answered some questions submitted on YouTube and Twitter. 
Olivers along with Krista Fuglesang also prepared for the second EVA and camped out in the airlock at a lower pressure to help get ready for EVA 2 on flight day 7. Topic: The 3rd of September, flight day 7 EVA 2. On flight day 7, Danny Olivers and Krista Fuglesang performed the second spacewalk of the STS-128 mission. Olivers and Fuglesang installed and connected the new ammonia tank assembly and also performed two get-aheads. The get-ahead tasks included installing protective lens covers on the Space Station Remote Manipulator System NB cameras. Once the ARTA was installed, the tank was integrated into the cooling loop. While Olivers and Fuglesang were outside, the rest of the crew continued on transferring items to and from both the shuttle mid-deck and MPLM. The 4th of September Flight Day 8 The first part of the crew day was spent off-duty. The crews enjoyed a meal, took a crew photo and took part in a POW event. More transfer was completed by both crews. The space station crew calibrated the Oxygen Generation System OGS, H2 sensor. Timothy Copper and Nicole Stott continued their handover activities, helping Stott who is taking over from Copper. Danny Olivers and Krista Fuglesang got their space suits ready for the third and final spacewalk. The pair spent the night in the Quest joint airlock, at a lower pressure of 10.2 psi instead of 14.7 psi. Topic: The 5th of September, Flight Day 9, Eva 3. During flight day 9 Danny Olivers and Krista Fuglesang performed EVA 3. The pair completed all tasks that were to be done, including installing two GPS antennas and deploying the Starboard 3 S3 payload attach system a new rate gyro assembly to and routing of Node 3 avionics cables. The joint crew also completed more transfer, mostly transfer for return to Earth in the MPLM and Space Shuttle mid-deck. The ISS crew also replaced a bolt on the common berthing mechanism CBM so that the MPLM won't get stuck, and also to ensure correct capture of the HTV. The 6th of September, flight day 10 off duty. Flight day 10 saw the joint crew's transfer samples from the space station to the shuttle freezer known as Glacier. The samples will be returned to Earth for examination by scientists who will develop ways to prevent bone and muscle loss in space as well as cures for other illnesses on Earth. The crews also completed some close-outs of the multi-purpose logistics module Leonardo. The last portion of the crew day was spent off-duty. Topic: The 7th of September, flight day 11 hatch closure. On flight day 11 the joint ISS – shuttle crews completed transfers and closed the hatches with the MPLM. Once the hatches were closed, the MPLM was deactivated, demated and berthed back in the payload bay of the Space Shuttle. During this process Jose M. Hernandez and Nicole Stott took part in a POW event. The end of the crew's work days saw the two crews say goodbye in a farewell ceremony and close the hatches between the shuttle and ISS. Once the hatches were closed, the pressurized mating adapter 2 was depressurized, in advance of undocking. The shuttle crew set up and checked out the rendezvous tools before going to bed. Topic. The 8th of September, flight day 12 undocking. 
On flight day 12, Space Shuttle Discovery successfully undocked from the International Space Station at 1926 Coordinated Universal Time. After undocking, the shuttle backed out and performed a fly around of the ISS. The Space Shuttle then performed two separation burns using its thrusters. After the separation burns, astronauts Kevin Ford, Jose M. Hernandez and Krista Fuglesang used the Orbiter Boom Sensor System to inspect the shuttle's thermal protection system When they completed that task the OBSS was berthed on the starboard sill of the payload bay and the Shuttle Remote Manipulator System was powered down. Topic: The 9th of September, flight day 13, end of mission prep. On flight day 13, the space shuttle crew began stowing items for landing. During the course of the day, Commander Frederick W. Sturkow and pilot Kevin A. Ford performed standard checks of the flight control systems (FCS), reaction control system (RCS), jets, and communications with the ground. The crew also deactivated the wing leading edge system WLES, stowed the KU band antenna, and reviewed landing procedures. The 10th of September Flight Day 14 landing postponed On flight day 14, Discovery was scheduled to land at Kennedy Space Center at 1904 Eastern Daylight Saving Time, 2304 Coordinated Universal Time. The landing was postponed due to weather conditions and the second opportunity at 2040 Eastern Daylight Saving Time, 040 Coordinated Universal Time was also postponed due to weather conditions. Topic: The 11th of September, flight day 15 landing. On flight day 15 at 1947 Eastern Daylight Saving Time, 2347 Coordinated Universal Time, Discovery started the de-orbit burn for landing at Edwards Air Force Base after its two landing attempts at Kennedy Space Center the previous day were waved off. Discovery touched down safely at 2053 Eastern Daylight Saving Time, 1753 Pacific Daylight Saving Time, 053 Coordinated Universal Time. The landing marked the final time a Space Shuttle mission concluded at Edwards Air Force Base, as well as the last time a ferry flight would be needed for an operational orbiter. Discovery returned to KSC on Monday, the 21st of September 2009, after refueling stops at Amarillo International Airport, Fort Worth Naval Station, and Barksdale Air Force Base on the 20th of September. The last seven missions of the shuttle all touched down at Kennedy Space Center. Topic: <laughs> Spacewalks. Each spacewalk was planned to last approximately 6.5 hours. Topic: <inaudible> Wake-up calls. NASA began a tradition of playing music to astronauts during the Gemini program, which was first used to wake up a flight crew during Apollo 15. Each track is specially chosen, often by their families, and usually has a special meaning to an individual member of the crew, or is applicable to their daily activities. Media See also 2009 in spaceflight List of human spaceflights List of International Space Station spacewalks List of Space Shuttle missions List of spacewalks 2000–2014